slightly non-uniform uh, channels. Uh, this work has been done in collaboration with my postdoc, Ruzbe uh, Mola Abbasi, who is also present here. So displacement in non-uniform geometries occur everywhere, and uh, non-Newtonian features are also pre prevalent. For example, in enhanced oil recovery, you have many examples of uh, displacement of non-Newtonian fluids in non-uniform geometry in pulp and paper applications, and you can have it in primary semantic, which is our favorite. You, you basically try to displace drilling mud uh, with, the, with the cement that is pumped into the oil well, and the analyst section of this uh, uh, pipe geometry is uh, non-uniform, but uh, the, and we have other examples. For example, zinc alkaline ba ba batteries, uh, printing devices, or long airways are examples of uh, where displacement flows in at least a degree of uh, with at least a degree of non-uniformity occur. So um, the aim of this presentation is to provide qualitative understanding of uh, the simplest uh, non-uniformity and the effect of that on the displacement flows, okay, buoyant displacement flows that we, that we study. Uh, the outline is as follows, I'm going to talk about the model, the displacement flow, the Newtonian um, fluids, and examples of pink home displacements, and I will conclude uh, really uh, quickly. So the, in terms of the geometry and assumptions, uh, we consider a 2D um, non-uniform plane channel geometry, as you can see here. Uh, the channel is oriented close to horizontal, a heavy fluid, displacing the light fluid, so we have the, basically the slumping pattern of the um, interface, and two, two fluids are miscible, but at the large peg length limit, so that uh, there is no uh, significant mixing between the two fluids, and we consider that the, uh, the limit of um, no surface tension of immiscible displacement. And we, we will rely on a classical lubrication model, which I'll explain later. Um, in terms of the geometry, you can see this um, uh, docked uh, or uh, to the uh, channel that is inclined with respect to uh, v uh, to the horizontal at beta. We have an imposed flow with mean velocity V0. We have the interface. We have uh, a characteristic uh, thickness of the channel, which is uh, D0, which is also the position of the initial sharp interface that we consider. We assume that the upper um, channel, uh, upper wall of the channel is angle with respect to the lower wall, but very, very small value, uh, so that we can uh, do some linearization. And the equations of, mo uh, oh, and also uh, we have, in terms of the interface, we have uh, somehow a leading front towards the bottom of the interface, and a trailing front, which is basically behind. That trailing front can move upward and downward, but usually the leading front goes downward. The equations of motions are the Navier-Stokes equations coupled to the, basically, the uh, incompressibility in which we have uh, Reynolds and fruit which we can put into one dimensionless parameter chi showing the ratio of buoyant stress, uh, stresses to viscous stresses. And we use a Herschel, Herschel Bartley model in general, but I will present only results for ping uh, fluids. Um, and we have, um, we have a viscosity ratio parameter, so looking at the, the dimensionless parameters that govern this problem. There will be um, uh, chi, the buoyancy number, two being home numbers of the two fluids, the viscosity ratio, and the power line disk. But I mentioned that we are going to use a leading order uh, lubrication approximation uh, for, for understanding of, uh, about these flows, and we all know that this leads to paradoxical results, which can be resolved by going to higher order terms. And, uh, but why, why we should use the first order first, because it's the first attempt and try to provide qualitative understanding. And the bottom line is that even if we went to higher order terms, we may not get beyond the qualitative understanding. And the reason I'm going to discuss with you is uh, one of the uh, simulations that we have performed using pelicans with um, uh, two dynamic six equations and concentration diffusion equation, discussing a very important features of these displacement flows, which is the static residual uh, wall layer. And for this particular case, the concentration diffusion, uh, the concentration color map, and the velocity profile. Um, if you look at them, uh, we can see uh, behind the front a pretty laminar flow for which we can develop a lubrication model. But what happens is that the, the dynamics of the front is very important in characterizing these flows and especially the static layer on the wall. So what happens is that the, the front is basically the velocity profiles at the front dance, basically uh, characterizing an initial. Uh, flow and um, uh, penetrating through the displaced fluid. So what happens is that if, if you 
develop a model even for a uniform channel, duplication model for a uniform channel, you cannot predict this uh, thickness correctly. So in the non-uniform channel, we expect the same thing. That's why we basically think that the, um, any order of lubrication approximation would be just qualitative understanding of these flows. So uh, having, uh, uh, having said this um, feature, we are, I'm going to talk about the lubrication approximation using a very um, old-fashioned style, uh, using a delta parameter to scale our variables, basically to uh, reach to the uh, reduced equations. And the delta we define ba basically by the um, dividing the uh, characteristic thickness of the channel um, over the um, characteristic spreading length of the interface. So this is not the length of the channel, but the uh, basically characteristic length of the spreading of the interface. Delta goes to zero at fixed Reynolds number. We integrate over uh, the bi momentum equation and we reach at a, uh, basically simplified equation for each layers of, uh, of, of this uh, basically configuration. We have the kinematic condition in a usual fashion, which we transform to an equation for the flow rate using the incompressibility, and the flow rate is basically the flow rate of the heavy fluid. The way we solve this is basically we set up a nested, um, uh, basically iterative method in which we guess an initial pressure drop. We try to satisfy the, uh, no, uh, the, the continuity of the velo velocity and traction at the interface, and at the same time, the condition for the flow rate. So basically, it's pretty uh, straightforward. <coughs> And uh, some examples of displacement flows in, uh, in Newtonian case. So here I'm showing uh, some examples, nine figures. In each row, alpha is fixed. In each column, viscosity ratio is fixed. And we, we start from a, an initial sharp interface using um, and solve the kinematic condition using a Van Leer a limiter uh, for, um, uh, for the flux limiter. And in the uniform geometry, we can basically see that uh, we have uh, for more viscous fluid displacing less viscous fluid, we have a better displacement. The same feature occurs in the uh, non-uniform geometries. Uh, one thing to note that is basically the height of the front and the speed of the front in uniform geometry is constant. In the um, conver in converging channel, for which I'm going to show two movies simultaneously, the front is actually uh, the height of the front decreases which is basically normal, and uh, the front uh, speed um, uh, basically increases. And the opposite is true for the diverging channel case. Um, we, the dashed lines um, on the superposed on these figures showed basically the predictions of the long time behavior for the height of the interface, assuming that the interface is elongated so that the, um, that the derivative of the interface does not play a role. So by writing, uh, focusing on the front, if assuming that the front has a high height hf at, uh, moving with the velocity of uh, vf, that uh, height times v should be equal to the to flow rate. And, the, and replacing the um, uh, front velocity by the derivative of the interface, we can basically uh, have, a, uh, uh, have a prediction for this front height uh, through this equation that I'm showing here. But uh, I will show that later this is not always the case that this works perfectly as you show here, as we see here. Uh, various flow reg uh, regimes can be observed even in Newtonian case. So I'm showing um, basically uh, the increasing chi, which is the buoyancy um, number for, dif uh, for um, different cases. And what happens is that at low, uh, at low buoyancy numbers, we have no backflow. So basically it's... Uh, and at a large, a large chi, we have a backflow, so we have a stream of the displaced fluid that moves upward due to the buoyancy, obviously. So in the, in the movies, corresponding movies, for example, focusing on this case, you can see that this uh, front is moving upward, okay, which is basically understandable why. Um, so we uh, characterize the different flow regimes, no backflow regime for small chi's. Uh, going to the uh, backflow regime, we have a regime that is um, at a critical chi, which is a stationary. Uh, interface flow regime uh, showing the onset of the backflow and then you have the backflow. And uh, if you consider the backflow case, we can term it a sustained backflow, meaning that you have a backflow that moves upward all the time. The particular case of the diverging channel um, is a bit uh, different, meaning that you have initially a backflow for large buoyancy, but we have observed that in all cases, this backflow stops at a certain location. And that's 
uh, sort of understandable because if you imagine that you have a, a constant density difference between the two fluids as the backflow moves backward in a diverging channel is going in a progressively narrower channel exper experiencing lower and lower buoyancy and at some point basically you have a perfect balance between uh, viscous dissipation and buoyant forces so that the backflow stops. So we have termed this an eventually stationary interface flow. Uh, English, um, uh, the, the, the people with the, uh, basically whose uh, mother tongue is English can propose a better basically term, but this is the term that we have came up with. So what is interesting again about the diverging case is that if you, if you, if you look at the, basically the prediction of the front height, you can see that these are almost perfect for all the cases except for the large buoyancy and um, large um, um, uh, annual diversion channel. And the reason for that is that, uh, I mean, in a nutshell, we cannot focus on the front to basically write the equal rule area for the, uh, for the, for the velocity of the front. So this is basically, uh, but I can discuss this further if you want. So, uh, and another interesting point is that among all these uh, figures, the figure that advances, I mean the front that advances the most is in the diverging channel. And it's very counterintuitive somehow. Because in the previous cases, in, in the, when we have no buoyancy, we, we, we saw that the front height uh, increases and the front uh, velocity decreases. But the, here, as you can see, um, so, uh, sorry about the movies, but as you can see, uh, the front is pretty short and it's going fast compared to all the other cases. So what happens is that our justification for this observation is that the, the front is going through a diverging channel, experiencing larger buoyancy, so it has to go faster, but due to the conservation of the mass, the height decreases. So basically this is our justification for this observation. And there are uh, uh, some other features that are interesting, existence of multiple fronts. So uh, it's possible to have multiple leading fronts and we have quantified that through repetitive computation, a region where you can have multiple fronts and your region you can have just single front. And what happens is that you can characterize this versus the velocity of the, sorry, the position of the leading front. Maybe looking at the movie is going to be um, uh, more observable. So I'm going to start with the sharp interface going quickly to two fronts and then the, as the leading front advances, I smear out the interface ending up with, with a one front. So this tells us we can do cool things with, with the only a simple geometrical change. The opposite is true for, for a converging channel, so it's less likely to have, sorry, diverging channel is less likely to have multiple fronts in a diverging channel. So going to the uh, Bingham case, uh, what we can see is that uh, for, a, for, a, for a given parameter set, in a uniform channel, you can have, by increasing Bingham number, you can go to a static residual layer uh, at the wall, for which we have uh, developed uh, following Alosh and Frigard back in 2001. We have followed up, uh, we have uh, developed a model for the maximal static residual layer, which basically uh, gives us a good uh, predictions of the uh, static wall layer. In the, the uh, converging channel case, it's interesting to see that you can start with a, uh, with a relatively thick uh, static layer, and as the model shows, at some point, this, uh, this due to the shear, the, this, the static layer disappears. And this is always the case for, for any given Bingham number, you have a distance at which the static layer disappears. Uh, the, somehow similarly, for uh, a diverging channel case, you have a critical distance for any given small Bingham number at which the static la uh, layer starts to appear. So, uh, just to conclude, uh, we have relied on a classical lubrication thin film approximation to simplify the governing equations. We have seen that we can do cool things with uh, just a, a, bit, a change of the geometry. Four, at least four main regimes are observed uh, in the case of Newtonian and in the case of uh, non-Newtonian qualitative understanding can be obtained uh, from, from the model. With that, I thank you. And Thank you for a couple of